So yes, innovative methods for searching digital device and data use during the COVID-19 crisis, what I'm talking about today, and there's all my affiliations that Jessica's just mentioned. I have quite a few hats and quite a few balls that I juggle along with all the hats, so, um, and affiliations. Um, but in these, all these um, centres and um, labs that I'm involved in, we're, we're basically interested in these kinds of things, or at least I am, and my team is, and I do use a very more than human perspective in understanding everyday life, embodiment, social relations, um, everyday practices, whether they're digital or non-digital. And I have three main precepts that I currently work with. And the first is understanding context. So um, responding to Haraway's view about that there's always a view from somewhere. We never have the God's eye view as a lot of sort of conventional science in post enlightenment times would like to have it. But in fact, we as researchers or we just as, as people, as humans, um, always have a view from a particular situated position. So that's something that I always want to acknowledge that you know, myself as a researcher, but also people that I'm working with, research participants, um, themselves have a particular situated perspective. And I'm really interested in exploring that in my research and understanding how that operates for, for people across a huge range of contexts. And secondly, understanding liveliness. Um, I've talked in previous times about lively data, but I also think that we need to understand not just digital devices and digital data as lively, but any phenomena, more than human, non-human, um, phenomena that we are part of as we move through our everyday worlds. It's lively things um, that have their own vibrancies and vitalities. And I'm constantly drawing on the work from not only feminist materialists, um, such as Jane Bennett, who does talk about lively or vibrant matter, um, and of course, Haraway again, and Barad and Rosie Braidotti all have that similar perspective perspective on understanding the vibrancies of more than human assemblages that humans are always already part of. Um, and the constant change and dynamism that's part of these more than human worlds is something that I kind of want to both surface and recognize in my work. But I also have lately devoted a lot of attention to looking at pre-Enlightenment cosmologies, Indigenous and First Nation contemporary cosmologies or non-Western cosmologies, because I think feminist materialists have been rightly criticised for ignoring uh, what we might call the old materialisms that are encapsulated in those kinds of um, cosmologies and philosophies that are always more than human and have been for millennia. Um, so what I try and do in my work recently is try, try and cite that kind of uh, work as well as, and in addition to an adjacent to feminist materialist work and to acknowledge that they are all part of, of a similar more than human perspective, but basically the, the old materialisms philosophies got there first. And I think it's a pity that a lot of feminist materialists still actually don't acknowledge that. So, you know, one of my eth ethical positions is to constantly acknowledge that. And thirdly, understanding the more than digital dimensions of digital tech use. So if we go back to this idea that we're always part of more than human worlds, um, of course, digital media, digital devices, software and apps are a central part of our worlds these days for many of us in the global north in particular, not for everyone, of course, because some people just still don't have access to them in low income countries. Um, but we often, if we work in digital media research, there can be this assumption that let's just focus on how people are using digital devices or, or engaging with their digital data without acknowledging that they are always inter interacting with those phenomena as they're moving through their everyday lives, through built environments, through their domestic environments or work environments, which are configured with and through a, a lot of other things, uh, other living things, other living creatures, uh, landscapes, built environments, space and place. So I'm always also trying to understand how those things come together, how the digital comes together with the more of the digital. 
So when I think about digital cultures, these are the kinds of dimensions that I like to look at. So beginning with the idea of technological imaginary, so how is it that we think about and imagine the properties that digital devices and digital data have, um, what they can do for us, what their benefits might be, but also what their harms might be are part of those imaginaries. Also the technological affordances that are built into or designed into digital dev devices and software. So what have, do they invite us as humans to do? What do they open? What capacities do they open to us? Um, and what do they close down? In fact, what don't they offer us in, in the affordances that they offer to us? And I also try and think about the fleshly body of humans um, and the bodily affordances that we have, our multi-sensory capacities, our capacity for memory, for learning, for responding to the world through our senses, through our imagination, and how, how those bodily affordances come together with the, the, the affordances of the technologies that we engage with. Also getting, getting back to the more than digital dimensions, other people and living creatures and how they are part of digital cultures, place space and other things. But also in terms of the broader digital knowledge economy and the infrastructures and, and the sort of socioeconomic dimensions in which we live our everyday digital cultures are very important, particularly for me as a, as a sociologist, I'm, I'm very interested in those sort of wider social structures and economic structures. Um, and how they structure or influence or have play some role or not in the ways that we engage with digital devices and software. So the COVID crisis. So um, one thing that I was faced with um, and many others of us who are social researchers used to conducting field work using digital face-to-face -face methods, traditional face-to-face -face methods, was that when the COVID crisis erupted and, and many countries went into lockdown from March 2020, we were suddenly faced, some, some of us are in the middle and just started field work, others were planning it. Um, we're suddenly faced with now what? What do we do? We can no longer meet face to face with people. We can no longer do traditional ethnographies. So what I did at that time, um, March, April, is I established a resource called Doing Fieldwork in a Pandemic, which I just used a very simple platform of Google Docs just to open a document under that title. And I, I know that Jessica contributed to it and her colleagues, which is great, but so did many other people all around the world, some of, some of which um, we know who did it. They, they uh, provided their names, other people did it anonymously. I added some materials, I guess, anonymously as well to, to just kick it off as well. Um, and I just um, edited the document, um, kept an eye on what was being put into it, uh, structured it a bit um, as it was being developed. And it ended up being around 40 pages long um, of very quickly, actually, really fabulous resources. So um, if you're interested in looking at all the ideas that people put into that document, do just um, do a Google search for it um, under that title and you'll easily find it. And it got shared on many research groups and university kind of department platforms and it was wonderful just how how quickly and readily people engaged with it and how much impact it had. Um, then I developed uh, with my Vitalities Lab team what we call breaking methods, short form methods explainer videos that we host on YouTube under that title. So we decided that given people were really interested in how to do social research um, in COVID conditions times and also teaching social research methods online, uh, we decided we would use these little short form videos as, as teaching um, resources so that people can just use them in their own teaching or if they're just interested as students, just to quick, have a quick look at them. So if you're interested again, um, go to YouTube and look for it under that title, Breaking Methods. Uh, and there's just an example of what it looks like, a screenshot from the YouTube channel. So in terms of going back to the doing field work in a pandemic document, there were ma two main types of methods that were suggested in that document. There was the traditionally face-to-face -face methods being transformed into distance or remote methods using often using uh, digital devices, but not always. And then there was suggestions about how to use born digital content so these, this was 
content that was created by people interacting with digital devices and platforms and social media, for example, uploading information about themselves or blogging or just responding, commenting on social media sites or making videos for TikTok or for um, YouTube, for example. So that content was already there. So there's a lot of really good examples in the doing field work in the pandemic for how to, to, how to really use that content that's already there um, for your own research. But what I would like to say too, is it's not all about the digital. In fact, many of research methods about understanding people's digital use, but also lots of other topics of their everyday life can be fruitfully explored using your old pen and paper approach, your old analog approach. Um, and they might include paper diaries or drawings, handwritten creative responses, mapping exercises, collages, letters, and cultural probes, drawing on design, research. And you can just send those things in the mail. They, they still can be remote. You don't have to meet with people. <laughs> they can send it back. Uh, you can leave stuff on people's doorsteps. And there's all different, lots of different ways that you can um, engage with people using, using these kinds of methods without having to be in the same room with them. So in recent projects, um, there's been two recent projects I'd like to talk about the time I had left. So people's use of digital technologies during COVID. Um, this started off as a project that was about just people's use of digital technologies in the home setting. And we were doing ethnographic um, video visits to people's homes in Sydney. Um, and we just started in early February, turning up to people's houses, um, walking around with them, getting a tour of their homes and videoing that as we went, asking questions and asking them about the devices that they had located in their homes, and also asking them about the digital data that these devices generated and how these all intersected together. And we used map drawing, sat down with them and, and asked them to draw maps about showing their devices in the home and also showing how the data were generated on these maps. Um, but then come mid to late March, when our government implemented our stay-at-home orders, our lockdown, our, the only national lockdown we've had so far, although we've had several localised ones since, um, we basically <laughs> were faced with, well, how on earth do we do continue this research, um, given that we can't go into people's homes anymore? So what we ended up doing is we um, used... Um, just the Zoom app um, and used it in real time. We rang up people, they had their mobile device on the other end, whether it was their phone or in some cases their tablet computers. And we did a video tour with them as they showed them, showed us around their homes, um, basically just holding up their phones like this, <laughs> talking to us, walking around the home. And we videoed that. And uh, and and then ask questions as we went. And we also did the map drawing. So we instructed them just to get a pen and paper out and, and ask them to do the maps. And then they took a photo of the map and sent it to us by email. Um, and I'll just have a few examples in a minute showing you what was generated. And uh, COVID Life um, is a uh, archive of photos that I took myself with my smartphone as I walked around my local environs. And I actually just today submitted a visual essay drawing on this archive. I have uh, over a hundred photos of um, the locations that I move through in my own experiences of COVID, of signage on shops and stickers on floors telling us where to stand, um, of um, you know regulations about physical distancing and testing that I just saw as I walked through my, my everyday spaces. So that was a very, that, it's what I call an effective visual ethnography because I, I've done an analysis of looking at the atmos effective atmospheres that had, were generated by the scenes that I captured on uh, my smartphone. So that was kind of a digitized way of doing it and a very quick and simple ethnography. But in the end, it actually generated a whole lot of really interesting images from my perspective and my experiences that I could use as this COVID life archive. So the, just getting back to the Living with Personal Data project, which involved the video ethnographies, the 40, we had 40 home visits, which started off as us in their homes, but ended up with us uh, streaming into their home on Zoom. We had the hand-drawn mapping, which is part of these home visits. And you can see on the left, there's, that's a screenshot of someone's video showing us who, as it turned out, we, we learned a lot about people's transition to working from home and 
teaching their children from home because that all happened just as we'd started our ethnographies. Um, so we were able to really get good insights in, into what it was like for people when they had to suddenly work from home or supervise two children from home. Um, and that's just an example of someone who's her home work set up in her home on the left there. Then we have an image, there's an image there of someone making their map a screenshot from one of our videos. Um, and then there's a creative writing prompt that we actually used as well in online workshops that we ran after we did the home ethnographies. And uh, we had a whole lot of creative writing prompts that I developed um, get, really getting at people's effective responses, which does get at the digital intimacies that I know that your network is interested in. And, and this is um, where we asked people in one workshop to write a breakup letter or a love letter to their data. And this is an example on the right, dear data, here are 10 things I hate about you. And that person goes on to list what they hate about their personal data as a breakup letter. So we, we were able to do that. We did those workshops um, with uh, groups online. Uh, we were planning originally to do them in person, but we had to put them online in the end. Um, and we generated just some really interesting data there in terms of um, the, the, the writing that people did in response to our prompts. And these are just some images that are part of my COVID life archive, which shows um, just the things that I noticed as I walked around my local environs, public transport, supermarkets denuded of um, hand sanitizer, um, a local reserve, which I mean, quite, I, I mean, I think it's ironic that there's a sign there, this massive reserve saying, please keep your distance from other people. And when I was standing there taking the photo, I could not see any other person. I could see a few kangaroos though. <laughs> um, it, yeah, so I mean, even then we were, even in such a huge space, open space, we were warned uh, to keep away from other people, which is all about our embodied experience of risk, I think, and that's what I talk about in my essay. And there were so many notices on building sites there. There were check-in at supermarkets. We had to do all this ritual of checking in, um, sanitising our hands, wearing a mask towards the end. So, yeah, I just recorded sort of attributes of everyday life, the digital and the more the digital dimensions of COVID living. Um, that's me walking, holding my face mask, which I put on if, if a person came near me, because for a while we had to wear them when we we're even just in our open space. And I figured if I couldn't see anyone else, I didn't really need to wear my mask. So I'd put it, if I saw someone home interview, I'd quickly put it on. <laughs> so I had this whole on and off mask thing happening. Then there's, um, pastries with a vaccine um, theme there. So I'm also interested in popular culture and how it responded to COVID life. Um, and then there started to be signs about telling people um, who are unvaxxed um, in Australia, in some parts of Australia, in some states of Australia, they weren't allowed into public spaces. Uh, and that still operates in some parts of Australia, whereas vaccinated people were to, to um, promote people to get vaccinated. Um, books on innovative and creative methods that I can recommend are here. And one of them is literally just been published um, that I edited with Dina Lay, which I thought I'd give a shout out because Jessica and her colleagues, Caitlin and Shiva, have a chapter in this book. It's a really, it's got lots of really great um, and interesting approaches to how to um, do use creative methods. Uh, it's there's a lot that's not about digital, but some of it is about digital as well. But there's a lot of hands-on methods as well, and, and here's just some other examples of books that I've found really um, useful in my own work. And finally, where to from here? Well, uh, current projects that I'm doing with my team, either from the Vitality Observer for the Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. I have two postdoctoral teams for each. Um, we're looking at new and emergent platforms for healthcare delivery. We're looking at um, what exists in Australia, but what's imagined and you know, what is actually existing. Because obviously, sometimes and often, in fact, there's a huge disparity between promotional discourses about new digital um, healthcare um, and when you drill down into whether any of them actually got up or were um, implemented or were actually successful, far fewer of them actually do exist. 
Um, so we're sort of mapping those landscapes. We're looking at digital health startup cultures. I've been doing ethnographic work with uh, people who are working in startup cultures. Here's my timer, so I'll just finish quickly. Um, I'm working on a project that looks at new forms of peer connection sharing, and we're actually talking to young people about their TikTok use and particularly how they use TikTok, TikTok as a sort of caring technology to show care for other users in TikTok. The health topics are a massive topic in TikTok, um, and that includes health care professionals making fabulous sort of health education TikToks for the young, for the predominantly young people who, who use TikTok, who are the main users of TikTok, but also um, young people themselves uh, seeking to educate people from everything from mental health to sexual health uh, and COVID health <laughs> and everything, basically any health um, topic you can think about, you can find um, hashtags for on TikTok. So very un underexplored platform in my view, particularly in terms of young people. Um, I've got a project with colleagues in New Zealand looking at dating app use in COVID times that we're using um, innovative methods such as the story completion method for, um, just got going. Uh, my next book that I've got to start writing is on the internet of animals because I've got talking about the more than human dimensions of digital intimacies. Um, I'm really interested in how animals have been digitized and datafied and smartified, shall we say, <laughs> uh, from, from agriculture to companion animals to wildlife. Um, so that's something I'll be working on very, very soon. And finally, creative methods. So I'm really interested in exploring even more with artistic methods such as sculpture making um, and also. Uh, working on exhibits um, and using curation as a research method. So there's a current project I'm working on with my team called the Health Data Sculptures Project, where we're, what we're trying to do is get people to think through the idea of human data, information about human bodies and how what the congruences are or resonances are or differences are with, for example, how a natural object such as a weathered um, wood um, and the kind of information we can learn about handling and looking at a piece of weathered wood versus what we might learn about our bodies uh, through other forms of information. So I'm very excited about that project. So, um, yes, so that, that's what I'm basically doing from now onwards. And uh, thank you for listening. And I'm really interested to hear any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you.